On the 6th of August, 1945, an aircraft took off that would make history. On board, a weapon with unprecedented destructive power. Its goal, Hiroshima. The discovery of nuclear fission made this bomb possible. Professor Meitner? Frau Professor Meitner? Never before in the history of mankind has science created an instrument capable of extinguishing humanity. This was made possible by nuclear fission. She felt responsible for developing the American atom bomb and also for its use. Of course, she suffered. In a letter to Otto Hahn, she once wrote, these bombs are a constant nightmare for me. Dear Otto, it's not easy to put into words the greatest monstrosity that has happened to me since my escape from Germany. The Americans have dropped this new bomb on a city in Japan, a bomb that is based on our knowledge of nuclear fission. Today, a reporter appeared in front of my house and wanted to know how I feel as the mother of the atomic bomb. I feel hurt and polluted. All I did with you was describe a physical process. In 1945, Lisa Meitner was totally bewildered. And there is also a quote from her, I have no idea what a bomb looks like. I do not know how one works. She distanced herself from it completely. Should this indeed be the result of my life of science? For me, it was always about the knowledge. I think of my childhood in Vienna. Maybe you remember the story. As a little girl, I wanted to test my loving God. She certainly distinguished herself with this need to know, with this great interest, and perhaps also through her home life, where she was challenged. She had a lot of freedom. Her father was an attorney, a very liberal person. They had Jewish ancestry, but they didn't practice the religion. He was a free thinker, a liberal, middle-class citizen of his time. You know how much music meant to me. So much so that on holidays I couldn't stop. My grandmother saw it very differently. Lisa, not on the Sabbath. God will punish you. And then she went a little further. So she was testing the hypothesis, and she discovered that uh, God did not strike her down, so she continued. To 
I don't know if that indicates huge talent in physics, but it showed that she was curious and that she uh, was thinking independently already as a kid. At her core, she was a very confident person. She knew she could do things, and when she wanted to do something, she just did it. I was the youngest, so my siblings called me their little dwarf. They always said, if it isn't in a physics book, Lisa can't do it. Yes, with housework I wasn't too good. But when it came to reading, I was the greatest. Nobody was better than me. Well, it seems that she was very interested in, in mathematics and in, in science uh, as, as a child. Uh, and uh, she, she herself told the story that she, um, uh, instead of just reading children's books in bed, she would be interested in reading um, about math when, when she was asleep, in, uh, when she was supposed to be sleeping in bed. I wanted so dearly to learn more about the world and nature. But mathematics and physics were subjects that did not exist at girls' schools. We weren't to be trusted with them. Oh God, it's madness. Why is this? Why is that? Such wonder and maybe... That was also something that set her apart, I believe, that she could marvel, could be pleased, ask, simply want to know. And she always said from very early on, or she wondered, could I succeed in becoming a scientist? A girl doing A-levels who was allowed to study was something very new in Vienna. My dear father made it possible for me and my four sisters to have this great privilege. Initially, the course of her education was normal. First, she went to elementary school, and then she went on to the town school. When she was 14, she was finished with the normal schooling for girls, but she had the opportunity to prepare for A-levels with private lessons. But you had to pay a teacher and make up the work, since she lacked the four years that the boys had in high school. I was aware of this opportunity and worked hard for it. In a very short time, I had learned four years' worth of material. There was no way I was going to disappoint my papa. Our father wanted to challenge his daughters, exactly as he had his sons. He refused to let us lace our corsets. Every book that we wanted to read, he would buy for us. He even read us Greek and Latin. Almost every day, I think about my childhood in Vienna, about my parents' house. It is the ground on which I stand. This exam day at the Academic Boys High School in Vienna would decide my life. To satisfy my burning desire to explore how nature worked, I absolutely had to be allowed to study physics. But how would all these professors see me? How would you feel if you had to go in there? You've worked so hard for two years, and now it all depends on this. And it was indeed a very impressive entrance hall. It had an almost castle-like character, this boys' high school, and not many were allowed in, and only a very few passed. Will I manage to become a scientist?
will I strive for pure objectivity? Will I be able to fathom the fundamental principles of natural events? And that's how she got authorization and was allowed to go to university. She was one of the first two who were allowed to study physics. In the seminars, I was the only woman amongst all the students. Yes, gentlemen. Don't be shy. Come forward, please, come. Ludwig Boltzmann was her most important teacher. And Ludwig Boltzmann was truly an exceptional person. Of course, he was a great theoretical physicist. Um, and renowned uh, all over Europe. It also turns out that he was apparently an extremely charismatic teacher. I attended many more seminars and lectures than my classmates. She was absolutely dedicated to her work, and she was apparently one of these people who, who really single-mindedly pursued physics because she was so... She was so good at it, she was so talented, but she also was so dedicated and worked so very hard. I worked day and night. The search for truth and insight drove me on. Professor, I believe the solution to the problem is... Professor? Ludwig Boltzmann was a father figure for Lisa Meitner. The professor took her seriously, encouraged her. Lisa Meitner had no idea that he was terminally ill. In 1906, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann died. He committed suicide. Uh, and they were looking for a replacement for him at the university, and they invited Max Planck. But he did not accept the offer of the position. He stayed in Berlin. And when Lisa Meitner uh, decided to look elsewhere for a year or so, she decided to go to Berlin to learn more physics, as she said, from Max Planck. When Dr. Meitner left her home at the age of 28, it was a turning point. She had invested her entire youth in her education. She didn't even think about marriage. She was drawn so strongly to Berlin, the center of the scientific world. She was hoping for new insights and inspiration from the greats of physics. When you think about it, Berlin was swarming with Nobel Prize winners. There was James Frank and Otto Hahn, Max Planck, Hertz. It was an incredibly elitist time. Berlin was known as the nest of science with all those Nobel Prize winners. You cannot believe how naive I was then. I traveled to Berlin with the greatest expectations without knowing that there, women were not tolerated in science. Thank God Max Planck made an exception for me even though he thought that the holy order would be disturbed by it, that women should be, first and foremost, wives and mothers. At first, I wasn't allowed to enter the institute buildings because I was a woman. There was a makeshift laboratory in the wood workshop, which came in very useful.
she went to one professor uh, that was Heinrich Rubens and asked um, if she could work in the laboratory somewhere. And Rubens suggested that she talk to Otto Hahn, who was a young man, a chemist who was just her age. And um, Otto Hahn showed up in the laboratory and they met and he immediately asked her if she would like to work with him. Miss Meitner, how nice that you found us. A warm welcome to Berlin. It seems that he liked the idea of working with a physicist. He liked the interdisciplinary aspect of it and understood that this was important for radioactivity. And it's clear that Han also liked working with a woman. They understood each other. She used to say she could accept him immediately, one to one. She never had any problems with authority. She said, I could always ask him if I didn't understand something. And he, he wasn't this professor who was 30 years older or 20 years older than her. He wasn't Max Planck. He was Otto Hahn. He was a bit younger than her, very unconventional, not at all stiff. And it worked very well. She simply wasn't allowed in the lecture halls. So it was lucky that this famous workshop existed. It was called the Wood Workshop because it was a room meant for a carpenter with its own separate entrance. Women were only allowed into the institute to clean it. The women scientists had to go into the cellar. Turn the light on, Ms. Meitner. I have never told you this, but without your informal and sincere manner, I would certainly have been even more of an outsider in Berlin in the early years. There was a strong, trusting relationship between the two of them from the outset. They were initially far apart scientifically because radiochemistry and theoretical physics are quite separate disciplines. But through radioactivity, their specialities um, converged. Right from the start, I was in awe of your intuitive approach. I myself was totally unlike that. Otto Hahn took her on immediately, and in my opinion, it was a congenial working relationship. They complemented each other perfectly. Lisa Meitner was the theoretician coming from the physics side. Otto Hahn was an unbelievably good analytical chemist. A wet chemist, we used to say then. It doesn't exist now. And they both completed each other wonderfully. Your intuition is often spot on, but I am then able to prove it and show correlations. It's clear that it was very important for her to have a young man just about her age, very informal and charming and nice. This was a perfect thing for her to come out of her shell and to begin to integrate into the, um, into the life of young scientists there in Berlin. Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn had a lifelong friendship which lasted over six decades two-thirds of both of their lives. For me, it refutes in quite a significant way the age-old belief that a man and a woman can't be close friends without involving sex. And I find that very, very interesting and very remarkable. This teamwork came to an abrupt end with the outbreak of war. All the men at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute reported for military service. Lisa Meitner also wanted to make herself useful as a hospital nurse. She just wanted to help and, well, alleviate the suffering of war. Apart from that, at the time she had nothing to do in Berlin. Everyone had been sent to the front. The gas war. Otto Hahn developed weaponized toxins and advised industry in the production of gas munitions. Together with other scientists, he performed dangerous experiments using gas masks on himself. 
Han was called up right away. He served in the army from 1914 to 1918. And of, of that time, he spent three of those years in Fritz Haber's uh, unit for uh, testing and using poison gases. Otto Hahn served his country with conviction in this gas war. Only later would he be bothered by the ethical questions of the inhumanity of these weapons of mass destruction. Lisa Meitner reports to the Austrian army. She goes to the Eastern Front. She was quite close to the front, so she saw fairly badly injured soldiers, men who couldn't be transported out, and they didn't have enough medication. Sometimes they couldn't communicate with the injured men, because there were many different languages spoken in the multicultural Austro-Hungarian Empire. Sometimes she worked from morning until night. Austria-Hungary suddenly ceased to exist, all at once. Everything was foreign. I didn't really know where I belonged. Science was my home. In the beginning, she had unbelievable problems getting used to the suffering of war. She suffered with the wounded. She worked as a radiologist, and after work, she sat on the patients' beds and tried to talk them into getting better. Believe me, Otto, choosing between science and marriage wasn't easy for me. Miss Lisa, may I, uh, and could I have a moment, please? I'll be back in a moment. There was an officer, his name was Muffat, from a very well-known Austrian family. He, as we used to say, paid court to Lisa Meitner and tried to forge a connection with her. I, I've been thinking. Um, like it is for you to have both a family and science, that is something that is not possible for us women. May I ask for your hand in marriage? Would my life have been better if I had made a different decision? If I had, as was simply normal for women, married and started a family? Maybe I wouldn't be all alone now, left by everyone in a cold, strange country. But I simply was not and am not suited for marriage, and I removed myself from that possibility forever. In the 1920s, um, this was really considered to be a golden age for physics, and people even were aware of it at the time because so many things were happening in atomic physics and eventually in nuclear physics as well. And there was a great deal of collaboration between experimentalists and theoreticians. And Lisa's um, a circle of colleagues included, well, in Berlin, there was Einstein, she worked with him. So Lisa's circle of people who were important to her, both professionally and personally, included really some of the most important physicists of, of that period. Einstein tackled some of the biggest questions. He wanted to know how God created the world beyond the boundaries of science and knowledge. Will I also succeed in this? Will I, as he has done, find answers to questions that bring us closer to ultimate knowledge? Science brings people to a contented pursuit of truth. The law of nature gives the true scientist profound joy and awe. The wish to understand nature has driven me since I was a child. The discovery of neutrons was announced at the Solvay Congress. The neutron is an electrically neutral particle, and in Italy, Enrico Fermi had the idea to shoot them at uranium. 
Uranium is the heaviest naturally occurring element, and he postulated that when you shoot neutrons at it, that are also, um, that occur in the atomic nucleus, then you can make transuranic elements, i.e. elements that are heavier than any that exists in nature. And he did it, and actually found that radioactive radiation is emitted. Lisa Meitner was so fired up when she read this work that she said, we also have to bring our expertise into play. And then they started to copy these experiments. We were feverishly looking for new transuranic elements, not realizing that this was an error which would eventually lead us to a momentous discovery. We wanted to penetrate deeper and deeper into matter. We wanted to know what holds the world together at its innermost core. The compounds were not kept in any kind of lead safe as they are today. They always had a box of uranium under the table and touched it with their hands, not even... They hadn't the faintest idea that that might be somehow dangerous. That's why it was very important in the new rooms that they worked so cleanly from the outset. The compounds were then hung out of the windows on strings. I used to dream of this life here in Berlin. Together with my colleagues and all these wonderful people, I seem to have arrived. She was fully integrated, you can imagine. Up to the age of 33, everything was wonderful. She could really say, I have achieved what I wanted to achieve. She went to international conferences, she held lectures. Einstein called her the German Marie Curie. So she was fully integrated and work was the most important thing for her. The institute was a bit like a surrogate family. Yes, my colleagues at the institute were my family. Berlin was my new home. But we were all too little interested in politics, too naive. We continued to do research and should have paid a bit more attention to the external conditions. Today, I know, we were all fooling ourselves. I just could not believe that my beloved Germany was capable of that. She witnessed a large number of her friends being dismissed and preparing to leave Germany. That included James Frank, Max Born. Einstein was already out right away. Lisa Meitner felt somewhat protected in the Institute. First of all, she still had her position. She still had, a, had her authority in, in the Institute. She had a pay, paycheck. Uh, she, she, she did not feel threatened. During this time, also, Max Planck, her, her dear friend, was president of, of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, and Otto Hahn was director of the Institute, so she had two very powerful people who were her friends, who. She, also uh, allowed her to feel that she was protected in the Institute. Why did you all not react when people who have served Germany well and honestly were driven out? What did they ever do to make them so unwelcome? There was no outcry about this. She stayed in Berlin. She was fooling herself a little and she always thought, Okay, soon it will be over, and they're Germans. It can't be that bad. In addition, she was Austrian. With the annexation of Austria, she became a citizen of the German Reich. Suddenly, she was German and subject to German legislation. Nevertheless, she still underestimated the danger she was in, but Otto Hahn convinced her of it. Lisa, we have to talk. Nobody. The Institute. We can't do any more for you. But... You know, I'm Austrian. Don't you understand? Okay. 
doesn't protect you anymore. Everyone was afraid. And then they all said, you have to go. We've arranged everything. I was unhappy and angry with you. I felt you had left me in the lurch. You'll need money. Here, sell it. She received all sorts of offers, which were more or less pretexts. She was really quite fearful of starting over without anything substantial. And the only position that appeared to be substantial was this offer that came from Stockholm. And the position seemed to be not temporary, but fairly permanent. And so she took she thought what she thought was the best offer. Well, to leave everything behind when you're in your late 50s and when you already have the life that you always wanted. And she wasn't naive. She realized that if she left, it would be a dramatic change in her life. Fearing arrest, Lisa Meitner spends the days before her flight anonymously in a hotel. With only 10 Reichmarks in her hand and the ring that Otto Hahn gave her in her hand luggage, she prepared to flee Germany. Her Austrian passport was essentially invalid. It made her, in essence, a stateless person at that point. And she had to have special dispensation from the Swedish government to allow her to come into Sweden at that point. Friends of Lisa Meitner had arranged for her papers not to be inspected at the border. A risky ploy. The greatest danger was, of course, the SS border check. I was so scared of being conspicuous and getting arrested. Today, we know what that meant for me. Everything that you once loved, that gave light and color and meaning to life, is suddenly in the unreachable past. The first letters she wrote from her exile are incredibly emotional, a true mirror of her desperation. As she writes, I'm freezing inside and out, and somehow I feel like a dead person whose voice will never be heard again, and that you can never again say to someone, do you remember the unbelievable loneliness? She suffered a lot, both professionally and personally. Dear Lisa, it is exactly 11 o'clock at night. I must write to you quickly before I go home. Something has happened which I want to tell you about first. The half-lives of the three isotopes have been found exactly. They can be split from all elements except barium, and all the reactions agree. There's only one thing I can't make any sense of. Lisa Meitner had practically no way to do experiments herself, so that the only possibility Hahn saw was to communicate via letters. He then kept her informed of all the significant developments and progress in their investigations. At the time, airmail service between Berlin and Stockholm was very good, almost overnight. So this method worked out very well. Could this be a highly unusual coincidence? The fractionation doesn't work. Our radium isotopes are clearly behaving like barium. 
If you could suggest something, even publish, then this would once again be a real job for you. Then he wrote to Lisa Meitner, something is wrong. We have checked it so often, we can only conclude that we have found barium. Maybe you can come up with some crazy explanation. It's late, and I must sign off now. Your Otto. That morning, she was reading this letter. Along came her nephew, Otto Robert Frisch, and saw that his aunt was very busy and asked her what's going on. And then they went on this memorable walk. Otto Hahn has written from Berlin. He's been working with Strassmann, looking for the transuranic elements, and has been bombarding the nuclei with slow neutrons. The results are quite startling. What did he say in his letter? He says that the radium isotopes are behaving like barium. That's got to be a mistake. Otto is far too brilliant a chemist to make a mistake like that. But how could that possibly be? If Otto and Fritz have discovered what I think they have, it contradicts everything we know about physics. It would be sensational. You don't mean nuclear fission? Yes. And it was hoped that energy would be released, because it was clear that when one breaks these bonds, the bonding energy would be released. That much was known already. And then Hahn went and did it, even though he didn't really understand it. Only Lisa Meitner did. Otto Hahn always said we were the chemists. We actually had no idea what we were really doing. The person who really knew and understood what we were doing was Lisa. She was the physicist. So we see here at this moment that he needed Lisa Meitner to do what she had always done in their team, which was to provide the physical explanation for the processes that were taking place. This can only be explained by the extension of the liquid drop model. What do you mean by that? Thinking as physicists, they always thought of the nucleus as a liquid drop, sort of something that was held together by surface tension, like a liquid drop of water. And then the idea came to Lisa Meitner that there were also positively charged protons, which would repel each other quite strongly. And maybe it was possible that the nucleus was basically constricted and that a waste-like structure formed, which then caused it to split. And as soon as they had this idea, they sat down on a tree trunk, took out a piece of paper, and worked out exactly how much energy this decay this split would release. And so they actually saw what they had found out. You're right. The charge of the nucleus is absolutely sufficient. Yes, in order to overcome the surface tension almost completely. What fascinates me personally about her is that when Otto Hahn made this discovery, her reaction was incredibly fast. She jumped right in and said exactly what was behind it. Quickly and succinctly, in just a few lines, she estimated exactly what he had measured. This is genius. Incredible. Look, Aunt Lisa. It's these moments of genius insight that fascinate me. And Lisa Meitner just had these brilliant moments where she made the connection between experiment and theory. That's really great when someone who is working experimentally still manages to bring it close to the theory and they know relatively quickly that's how it is. Here it's the power. The sheer nuclear power that holds everything together, and we are releasing that. It's like freeing a monster. But where does it come from? Where does it come from, this enormous amount of energy that is generated when the nucleus is split? Where would that energy come from? And Lisa Meitner understood that when you have smaller nuclei, the mass of those nuclei is somewhat less. And she quickly did a rough calculation in her head, and she realized that the amount of mass that is lost when a uranium nucleus splits into two smaller ones 
just about gives enough energy to drive those nuclei apart. So they understood the energetics of fission right away. They understood the surface tension aspect of the splitting of the drop. And they also immediately understood that the transuranium elements that they'd been looking at for all those years were not actually elements bigger than uranium, but they were fission fragments that they had been looking at. So they understood the entire process very quickly. And this energy is a thousand times greater than any chemical reaction. The potential of that. I believe that in that moment when Lisa Meitner calculated how much energy would be released, and if only a little, not a case of two plus two, but hundreds and thousands counted together, it was clear that if this were known in military circles, the potential for weaponization would be immediately seen. There was always the talk of a Wunderwaffe, and she was very afraid that Germans might be uh, succeeding. And of course she knew about the Manhattan Project as well through, through her nephew. But here it was, as she had probably hoped it could never be accomplished. In the beginning, it was believed that the amount of material needed to start a chain reaction, like for a bomb, was much higher. So everybody sat back and calmly said, well, it'll never happen. But then von Weizsäcker at some point recalculated it, with pails, I believe, and then Otto Robert Frisch also played a role, and only then did the project really start. The Americans also started to research in earnest then. The knowledge that this fundamental phenomenon of nuclear fission, the splitting, can be converted into a technical phenomenon, namely the atom bomb, that was quite sudden. Einstein also tried in America to, to, to bring influence to bear and to say, you have to be careful. If the Nazis put two and two together, they're also going to know immediately how to build a bomb. Albert Einstein's warning to Franklin D. Roosevelt didn't fall on deaf ears. In order to forestall the Nazis, the American president instituted an unprecedented secret operation, the Manhattan Project. Up to 200,000 people working under incredible pressure trying to build an atom bomb, including many German scientists. In particular, it was the Jewish scientists who were involved in the Manhattan Project in large numbers in the USA. For them, it was a matter of life and death whether the Germans would be able to build a nuclear bomb. In a relatively short time, the researchers managed to go from the pure theory to operational bomb with an explosive yield of 21 kilotons. They called it Gadget, the toy. Many believed that this weapon would never work, Others, that it meant the immediate end of the world. In July 1945, the first atomic bomb in the world exploded in the New Mexico desert. If other progressive developments in military technology had only delayed the end of the war, then the bomb would have been used on Germany. That's what it was made for. In actual fact, sources document that the first use of nuclear weapons was planned for Mannheim and Ludwigshafen. But the war ended too quickly for this to be implemented. The bomb is the ultimate proof of US military strength. The Japanese threatened to fight to the last man the American politicians wanted a quick end to the war. An invasion of Japan would have resulted in many casualties. Ethical concerns about this weapon did not exist. The Americans wanted to demonstrate their strength to the communist Soviet Union as well. Later, many reasons were given for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and just as many against. Even leading American military personnel thought it was unnecessary and not useful. My father came to pick me up at school. He was sick. 
He put me on his shoulders and we went home. If there's a hell, I saw it. I still can't forget these scenes. A man with his eyeballs popping out was crawling on the ground to escape. A mother holding her baby, blackened like charcoal, was writhing on the ground as well. I saw those people, so many people, from my father's shoulders. The most shocking thing for me was a girl of my own age. Her eyes met, and she asked me for help and water. I have never forgotten her eyes. I couldn't help her. She probably died, I think. But I did not build that bomb. And I am appalled by what it has done in Japan. I didn't bomb them. And I cannot understand why people connect me to this horror. Living with my loneliness and the loss of my past, what have I done to deserve such accusations? Lisa Meitner understood instantly that this was the bomb that she had been so concerned about. And her reaction was just uh, extreme grief and anguish. She had not taken part in, in the building of the bomb, but of course she had been part of the beginning of it, uh, the, the initial discovery. She uh, always felt uh, that the development of nuclear fission in a sense had spoiled her joy in, in nuclear physics. Prior to that, nuclear physics had been kind of a pure uh, experience where you are finding new things about the world and the universe. And the use of, of her work having ultimately resulted in, in, a, in such a devastating weapon was something she never quite got over. It's a bit like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. The spirits that we summon through physics, because they fascinated us, we couldn't dismiss again. Hardly any other physics discovery was transformed into military technology as fast as nuclear fission. And so we are, of course, also as responsible as those who have committed the sin. We looked into Pandora's box, namely in this case the atomic nuclei. We didn't have to work experimentally. We could have also worked purely theoretically. That means we knew exactly what we were doing, and we did it. After the atomic bomb, I was going the way of a scientist by myself. I found that the results of science are not always good for humanity. But in some cases, they lead to the worst case such as the atomic bomb. I think scientists should not only be interested in their research, but also in society and the practical use of their research results. I know from my standpoint as a scientist, scientists want to know something and discover it before thinking of using it. I do not deny that but they should bear the heavy responsibility. Neither Hahn nor Meitner could have remotely foreseen the consequences at the time of their discovery. They were completely surprised by what then happened to it. Of course, she said of the atom bomb, a shadow has fallen on science. And that was always a kind of comfort for her. She said, science isn't evil, people are evil. Ah, 
Our world is falling apart. Ethics and religions have failed. Otto, I only described with you a purely physical process. Yes, that should have changed the world, but not so that people would lose their lives to it. I never wanted that. I have no idea what a bomb looks like. I also do not know how one works. I have no idea what a bomb looks like. I do not know... I...